So Jesus is hanging on the cross, and one of the last words he has on the cross is that he says to his mom, Behold your son, and then he's talking about John, and then John, he says, Behold your mom. And we read, at that time, John brought her into his own home to take care of her. So even though Jesus is getting ready to die and ascend into heaven, he still honors his mother by uh, providing for her, making sure that she's going to be taken care of. So as Christians, we give parents special honor as God's representatives on earth, gifts of God through whom he gave us the gift of life. How can I show I honor and cherish my parents as gifts of God and as his representatives on earth? So keep that in mind as we go through this lesson. How can I do that? Question 54. Why does this commandment focus on parents and other authorities? Now, just to kind of let you know here, the first three commandments deal with our relationship with God. The, the other seven deal with our relationship with our neighbor. And we'll define that in a little bit, but our neighbors, those around us. And the fourth commandment starts with those that we are so close to in our own home, and specifically our parents. So why does he give this commandment? Well, A, a mother and father uniquely serve as God's representatives through whom he bestows and nurtures human life on earth. If it wasn't for your parents, you wouldn't be here. Think about that. I don't want to blow your mind. If it wasn't for your grandparents, your parents wouldn't be here. And then your great-grandparents, and going all the way back. God bestows this wonderful <coughs> gift on us, and he gives us mothers and fathers, also other authorities, as it says here, legal guardians, pastors, teachers, employers, government officials, also serve as God's representatives for the support and protection of our life and on, here on earth. So these are God's gift to us. Always think of it. Oh, God's gift to us. Now, how do we fear and love God in keeping the fourth commandment? Um, and if you notice here, Luther, Martin Luther does this wonderful job. Each of the commandments, he always says, we fear and love God. A reference back to the first commandment. It's always back to the first commandment. Having no other gods. Back to the first commandment. Well, we live, uh, fear and love God by not despising our parents, guardians, and other authorities. And despising means, flip the page, one, looking down upon them or making fun of them. Now, what, let's just put it this way. God has given you your parents and you think you're smarter than them. Well, you might be. Might there come a point where you make more money than them? Maybe. Might there come a point in your life that you're given a position of authority that you might be over them in that position? Does that negate them still being your parents? No. They're still your mom and dad. They are still God's representative in your life. Proverbs 23. Listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Just remember that. B, disobeying or rebelling against their God-given authority. God has given them to you. He's given them authority over you. And for the most part, they know what's best for you. Believe it or not, they actually know something about life. Hmm. They actually know how life works many times. They've been there, done that. Now, as I, when my children were younger... Um, they would jump on the couch. And what would I always say? Don't jump on the couch. Why would I say that? Because what might happen? They might get hurt. And what would they do? Well, they would jump on the couch and then they would get hurt. And what, what's the first words I want, I want to say out of my mouth? I told Well, I couldn't say that because my... But I told you not because of your own good. I don't want you to do that because you might get hurt. That's why God gives us these people in authority over us because they know what's better. They know what they watch over us. These, this is God's gift for us. Now, what happens when um, we, dis, we do disobey and rebel against um, God's given authority? Now, this is the Old Testament. Turn to Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. 
And not that I'm implying anything here, but I think the Old Testament might have gotten this pretty, pretty well. Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21. Is everybody there? Just follow along. This is Old Testament stuff. If a man has a stubborn or rebellious son, and I'll put in their daughter, who will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and though they discipline him and will not listen to them, then his father and his mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city at the gate, the place where he lives, and they shall say to the elders of the city, this is our son, um, this our son is stubborn and rebellious, and he will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So they who shall purge the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Now, I'm not applying here, but... <laughs> just stone them to death. I mean, that was Old Testament stuff. That, that if children would not heed the discipline of their people in authority, their parents... <clears throat> God gave the right to the parents to take them to the officials and the officials could do something with them. The parents couldn't do it, but they could take it to the officials and that's and you'll see how that plays itself out, how God gives us the gift of government to do those things. I'm not implying anything by that, just throwing that out there. You know, because God has this unique way of taking care of people who do not want to be disciplined. Now I want to look at the word discipline. What? Well, let's just look at it. What do you see that what word what other word do you see in that? Disciple. Disciple. Remember, the last chapter of Matthew, Jesus says, Go and make what? Disciples of all nations. Disciples are followers. <laughs> no, whatever. Spell check. Here, I'll do this. <laughs> but that, so that's what it is. Discipline, disciple. God disciplines us because he loves us. God doesn't sit up in heaven and going, aha, I can get them. Or your parents don't sit up and go, ha, oh, we can do this. God disciplines us because he loves us. Now, going on, we fear and love God by receiving and recognizing parents and authorities as his representatives. We do that by honoring them. Turn to Mark 7. Mark 7, verses 10 through 12. Now, Jesus is talking some to uh, some of the religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, and, and they had all these different rules that they had. They thought, oh, we can do this. And, and uh, verse 10 says, and, honor, and Jesus said, honor your, you said, honor your father and mother, and whatever, uh, whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever uh, uh, you would have gained from me is Corbin, that is given to God. Uh, that when you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that have hand, uh, you have handed down and many such things. So God, Jesus is staying here is that we honor our parents. Um, and here he's talking about the traditions. But that what they would do is they would say, oh, I got to do this. This is more important than this. This is more important than me honoring my father and my mother. And, and things like that. Now, we don't have those traditions uh, necessarily here, but there are things in our life that ask yourself, am I honoring my parents by doing this? If my mom and dad expect me to be doing something, but I say, oh no, I want to do this because I think this is more important, then you're dishonoring your parents. And then he even goes, I don't care how old you are, 
You still gotta honor your parents. I am an adult, I have my own children. Guess what I do every Sunday afternoon? I call my mom to talk to her. I honor her. I, and, and then she lets me talk to my dad, which is a 30 second conversation many times. How's it going? Good. What are you doing? Watching TV. What are you watching? Gunsmoke. Uh, great. I guess I'll talk to you later. Because <laughs> I know he's going, get off the phone. I'm watching the TV show. But honoring our parents. However that goes. They ask you to do something, you do it. If they ask you not to do something, then you don't do it. Many times they're doing it because they love you. The other thing is that we serve um, and coming to the aid of our parents. You are to serve your parents. You are to take care of them. Uh, you are to help them um, with that. We just read from, you know, John 19 earlier. Turn to Genesis 47. Turn to Genesis 47. Beginning at verse 11, 47, verse 11. Remember the story of Joseph, uh, the favorite son of Jacob, Israel. Uh, his brothers didn't like him. They sold him off into slavery. Um, and the brothers gave the impression to their dad that Joseph died. But Joseph didn't die because all of a sudden he's the second most powerful person in all of Egypt. And uh, this is what happens. Uh, then Jacob, dad, finds out that Joseph's alive, and not only is he alive, but he's thriving and, and a very powerful person in Egypt. And Joseph um, tells his dad to come and live in, in Egypt, the land of, of, of Goshen, so that, that uh, he can be taken care of. Joseph uh, saw everything that took place in his life as God's way of preparing to take care of God's people. Um, so Joseph saw all those bad things that happened, that that was God's way of getting him to Egypt so that he could take care of his family um, and ultimately making sure that the Savior is born. I mean, this is huge picture here uh, that Jesus would eventually come. And so we see here Joseph honoring his, his father and his family by uh -huh. making sure that they are taken care of. We also, a uh, letter C, uh, in your catechism on page 82, that we obey our parents and pastors and teachers, employers and government authorities. Um, look at verse uh, Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you, that you may live long on the earth. And that is true. When God gave the commandments the first time in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5, this is the only commandment he adds a promise to. He says, if you honor them, then things will go well for you. Why do you think that is? Why do you think in honoring and obeying your parents, if you did that, it would go well with, for you? What would be the ultimate goal here that God has in mind? My dad said to me, Scott, don't speed when you're driving. Why would he tell me that? So I don't hurt myself or hurt anybody else. I tell my children, don't jump on, jump on the couch. Why? Because I want to get me hurt. You know, this kind of things. And just by default, when we follow... Um, the authority of our parents and do what they say because they're doing it out of love for us then we do make good choices we do we can live a long life um, and, and in the promises that God gives to us and ultimate the ultimate blessing is uh, uh, having eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord uh, as well so that we that we have that now uh, Hebrews 13, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy, not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Remember, God gave your parents, 
pastors, teachers, those in the government, all those in authority over us. He's given, he's given us this job, this mission, if you want to put it that way. And, you know, we're going to have to give an account for that. And as the writer of the Hebrews says, um, let them do this and let them have joy in doing this. Don't let them be frustrated that, that, this is, that they have to do this. Now, I just want you to know, kids, that your parents don't, you know, lie awake at night wondering how many ways they can frustrate you in your life. It just comes naturally, just to let you know. But then on the other hand, you parents, um, your, your kids are not lying awake at night wondering how they can frustrate you. It just comes naturally to them. They, they, they just, it just happens because that's what we do. And that's where we grow. And that's how we, that we realize the gift here that we have. Letter D, loving and cherishing our parents and other authorities on account of their God-given vocations. We honor them because God said so. We honor and we love them and we serve them because God said so. And that's enough. If your parent says, let, well, let's just see. Let's use an example here. Uh, how many kids in here have cell phones? Now, well, let's just say that somewhere along the way, your parent takes your phone away. Of course, you're going to say what? What's your, going to question? What's your question to me? Why? Why are you taking my phone away? Why? Every parent has, a way, has the right to say, because I just say so. <clears throat> now, the parents should have a pretty good reason why, but... They can just say it because I just said so. And you have to honor that. You have to respect that if it's for your own good. Now we're going to talk about what happens when they do other things that are not for your good, what we can do about that. But we'll get to that in a little bit, um, which is right here. Well, actually, let's turn to uh, Leviticus 19.32. Leviticus 19.32. Is everybody reading it? What should you be doing in my presence? What should you be doing in my presence according to Leviticus 19.32? Look at my head. What should you all be doing? Stand up. Do it now. It said so. You should stand before the gray hair and honor the face of an old man. What? Why do you think that is? What? What is when you? Well, he doesn't have to because he's got gray hair. What is, what is standing up when someone comes into the room? What, is, what, are, what are you doing by that? What are you showing? You're showing respect. You're showing honor. Uh, in the Bible, gray hair actually means someone who probably has some wisdom. Someone who has some authority. Someone, you know, might know something. And God says, you know what? Those people have been around. They know what's going on. You know what? You should honor them. You should respect them. And as it says here, you should stand up to show honor and respect for those who have authority over you. I remember as a kid at school, uh, every we would, you know, when the principal walked into the classroom, you know what we all did? We stood up. We stopped everything and we stood up because we were showing respect to the principal or the pastor or whoever, even a parent who came in. We stopped everything, they knocked, they came in, we stood up to show honor and respect. Um, that's, that's what we did uh, because God said so. And that helps us to realize about what that's all about as well. Um, turn to Proverbs 23, verses 22 to 24. Proverbs. Verses 22 to 24.
Listen to your father who gave you life, and do not despise your mother when she is old. We read this already. By truth, do not sell it. By wisdom, instruction, and understanding, the father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. So if you want to make your dad glad, acquire wisdom. And wisdom ultimately comes from God. Ultimately comes from God that we have that. All right, let's just move on here. What if my parents and other authorities poorly carry out their vocations from God? In faith and obedience to God's word, we respect them as those who have been given the privilege of representing God to us. Now, what do your parents have and that we have as well that kind of messes things up? Sin. Sin. you got to remember that even those in authority over us, there's this. They're <coughs> sinful human beings. They're not perfect. There's only one perfect one, and that's Jesus. That we sin. So part of that is knowing that they might mess up. But then forgive them. Knowing that you will mess up, and they will forgive you as well. And that's just part of this learning process um, that, that we go through. Uh, that we have that. Turn to page 33 in your catechism. So go back to front part of the catechism, page 33. Um, actually, turn, jump over to page 35. This is the table of duties. This is um, uh, part of the last part of the catechism that we have. And just some Bible verses that uh, remind us of what we, who we are and what we should be doing and uh, not doing. Um, two parents, Ephesians 4, fathers slash mothers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, then bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. What does the word exasperate mean? Do you know what exasperate means? Some translations of this says, uh, parents, don't anger your children. <clears throat> well, I would break that all the time because my children get angry at me. In fact, that's how I know I'm doing my job right, when they're angry at me. But that's not what that means. The word exasperate. Exasperate. Let me know what that means. Meaning, exasperate means angering your child so much that they lose hope. They lose hope, meaning they think, well, what's the point? I can't do any more. There's nothing more I can do to please you. So why would I even try? You know, people who lose hope, that's, that's, that's huge. Um, I think in the manual, instruction manual for uh, Navy SEALs, there's a, um, a list of, they, have, they, they call it threes. Uh, you know, three seconds, uh, three minutes, three hours, three days, three weeks, three months, and, and all of that. And um, the three second rule, w which I thought you would think, wow, of all, of all things, really? Three seconds. Um, do not lose hope for more than three seconds. Really? I mean, three minutes is make sure you breathe in three minutes. You know, three hours if you're somewhere, make sure you're building a shelter. Three days, make sure you're eating, you know. Uh, and drinking and things like that, but that first one, three, don't lose second, don't lose hope for more than three seconds. And as parents, God gives us, we have been given that authority, but God also holds us accountable for that and saying, how are you raising my children? Because ultimately, the children that you're raising, they are God's. They're not yours. They're just on loan. God has given you this gift. And our job is to bring them up in the, in the uh, knowledge and the nurture of the Lord. And part of this is we have to be very careful that we don't exasperate them. Do we anger them? Yes, of course. There are times and places that need to happen. But we don't anger them so much that they lose hope. And each child is different to the gifts and the abilities that God has given to them. You know where your child should be. There are times when you need to push them. But you also know that, that they, they can't do, they, they're doing the best they can do. They're doing the best that they can do. And you have to remember that as well. Uh, but then you kids, going down to the next one, 
Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right on your father, for it's just the first commandment that God gives a promise that it may go well with you. So God gives you this gift of your parents because he loves you. And the parents you have are the parents he wants you to have. It's always easy to look at other people's parents and say, oh, I wish I had them as my parents. Well, chances are you probably wouldn't like them after a while because God gave you your parents, just like God gave uh, you as our children, and um, that, that we do that. Now, you see here the rest of the, you know, to workers of all kinds, we honor and respect those in authority over us. Employers, remember that these are God's gifts as well. And so that's what's going on uh, with that. Now, question 57, am I always to obey my parents and other authorities without question? No, there are times, Back to page 83, sorry. Back to page 83, question 57. No, we must disobey them if they require us to disobey God's word. And you see the Bible passages there. We must obey God rather than men. Children, obey your parents to the Lord, for this is right. Then he said, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. There, if your parents and people in authority over you tell you to do things that are contrary to God's word, then you can say, no, that's not right. I'm not going to do that. And God, and that's not, they're disobeying God. So you're just following in God's commandment. Now you can't make things up. Like, well, God didn't tell me to clean my room, but my mom's making me do it. But I don't think, I don't see, I don't read that in the Bible. Well, actually, he does. <laughs> you know, if, God, if your parents say, you need to clean your room for your own good, then you make it happen. And your parents can just say, because I said so. And sometimes it's just that. Sometimes God says that to us because I just said so. And we just got to follow and trust what he's doing for us as well. Uh, for, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. I'm going to be on top of page 84. So 1 Peter chapter 2, 18 and So right there, 1 Peter 2, 18 and 19, Peter wrote, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrow when suffering unjustly. So there are times when, when we have to say, no, we're not going to do that. But there are other times where we have to submit to them. Now, in the, it says, the note here, this is important in our catechism. We must distinguish between what the government permits people to do and what it compels them to do. When it compels us to act contrary to God's word, then we must disobey and live as God intends. When government permits activities contrary to God's word, for example, abortion, no-fault divorce, same-sex marriage, we bear witness by living as, as God intended. This, this commandment, the last starting in March, um, was one of these things as pastors in the church um, we struggled with. Because the government, the governor said, what did we have to do beginning in March? We had to shut everything down. We had to shut it down, including church, you know. And we're going, but wait a minute, that well, we're the church. And, and wait a minute, we, God says we need to have church. And, and that. But what did we do? I mean, did we have church? We did, but not the way we were used to. We got creative. And as I like to say, uh, the technology curve went on whew, straight through the roof and tried to figure out how we do that. Now, here in Indiana, we've been going to church since the second Sunday in May. And, I, you know, we've been very thankful for that. I have friends in California who are still, sometimes they have church and sometimes they don't. 
Sometimes they can be inside, and sometimes they can't. And, and all this you know, kind of going on with that, and they're struggling with that and saying, at what point, at what point do we say we must obey God rather than men? And that, and I, I can't answer that right now, but there, there comes that point where you have to ask that question and say, which is more pleasing, that we do what God says, or do we live under the authority of, of what government says? And that's always the struggle that we have. Um, I pray that we're getting that, I pray that we learn how to live with this pandemic, because I don't think it's going away, that we just live, how we're gonna live with this, and how we're gonna you know, deal with this for the rest of our lives. Um, but there are times and places where we say no, we say no. I think one of the examples in our nation, and we're going to get to the in the fifth commandment as well, is abortion. That we say no, that's wrong. Even our government says, sure, abortion on demand. Mm. Even up to the time it's being born, you can abort the baby. We say, as God's people, we say no, that's wrong, and we protest. And in our nation, <clears throat> we can elect people <clears throat> who think the same way that we do, so that the laws can be changed that we can change people's minds and hopefully change their hearts as well. That we can do that and we should do that as God's people, uh, especially in our nation that we are being given that, that uh, responsibility and that privilege as well. Question 58, what promise does God give us with the commandment and why does he give it? God promises that those who keep the fourth commandment that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the, in the land or on the earth. This promise highlights the vital importance of parents in raising children to grow up and become responsible members of society, wise caretaker of God's creation, and faithful witnesses to the gospel. We are always, always, God is always using us for the next generation, that we tell them that, we can, that, um, that uh, they are God's people and they are God's children so that they can tell that to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. So I want everybody, uh, you kids, look to your parents or whoever's here, and I want you to say to them, thank you. Do it right now. Thank you for everything you do for me. And you parents, say, thank you for being my wonderful child. And smile doing it. All right, page 85, 85, I'll cover this pretty quick here. Um, what is the fifth commandment? You should not murder. What does this mean? All right, turn to Luke chapter 10, Luke 10. Beginning of verse 25. The parable, the story of the Good Samaritan. A man asks, a lawyer stands up and asks Jesus, um, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, what's the law read? How are you reading? So, well, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And, and Jesus says, you have answered correctly. So you love God and love love." those around you but then wanting to to justify himself in other words wanting to clarify exactly what he had to do he asked the very simple question who's my neighbor and then Jesus says okay I'll tell you a story where there was a man traveling from Jerusalem um, down to Jericho so you gotta understand Jerusalem's up on a mountain and Jericho is down so they're they're not going south they're just going down the hill down the mountain and he falls among robbers they strip him and beat him and, and leave him for half dead by chance, a priest was going down that road, saw him pass by another side, so did I. A Levite, he did the same thing. But the Samaritan came and saw him and decided to help him. Now, who are the Samaritans? Do you know who the Samaritans are? All right. I live in Samaria. Thank you. Or as I like to call it, Samaria. Because you got northern Galilee where the Jews lived, 
you got the southern part where Judea lived, and in the middle was Samaria. Now, Samaria were made up people who were not pure Jewish bred. They had other parts of blood in them. And so the Jewish people would look down upon them, so much so that they would not travel through Samaria. So remember, you got northern in Galilee, you got Judea in the south, and in the middle you got Samaria, or as I like to call it, Samaria. Huh. Huh. You'll remember that. <laughs> the Samaritan. So this guy, he's a Samaritan. The, the Levite goes by, the priests go by, they are Jewish people. They are the, as people say, oh, they're the best of the best. But yet, they see this guy who's half dead, they're not going to help. Now, they might have excuses or reasons, but they didn't help. This guy needs help, and the Samaritan stops. And not only does he stop and help, but he picks him up, takes him to a place, and he tells the guy, I'm going to, whatever it costs, take care of him. Just whatever it costs. And then Jesus said, of the three, who was the neighbor? And this young lawyer had to say, the one who helped him. He couldn't even say the Samaritan. He said, I guess the one who helped him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. That's who we are. Um, and so we have this. So this, you know, God wants us in this commandment is to appreciate the gift of life. The gift of life. And, of course, we have to ask the question. I'm going to jump down to who's my neighbor. Well, anybody who God puts in our lives, whether it's mom or dad, brother or sister, grandma, grandpa, or a complete stranger. Sometimes God, people, God puts people in our lives that need our assistance, that need our help. Um, and then, um, you know, question 60, how do we fear and love God in keeping the fifth commandment? Well, first, we fear and love God by not harming our neighbor. Harming our neighbor includes murder, obviously, taking the life of another person without just cause. Uh, letter B, page 86. Doing or say anything that injures or endangers another person. Oh. So we, we have that. So we don't physically hurt someone or murder someone. Oh, but what if we don't do anything or help someone who has been seriously injured? Or just injured in general. Oh, that kind of, Jesus kind of throws that into that as well. Um, and uh, things like that. So, and then, neglecting to help people who are in bodily need. So we see someone in need, and we like the Levite and the priest, we walk on the other side. We don't help them when we could help them. Or D, harboring anger or hatred in our heart against our neighbor. Now, one of the confessions, it's usually in the first Sunday of the month, uh, we say that we are by nature sinful and unclean by, what, by our thoughts, words, and deeds. Um, that, you know, we can sit there, well, I haven't murdered anybody. Oh, I mean, physically hurt someone. Oh, I've helped everybody. But what about my thoughts? Are my thoughts always pure? Or do I wish ill will to that person? You know. I know I'm not the only person when I'm driving around and someone in front of me is driving crazy. You know, you're going, oh, why are you doing this? The light is green. Would you go? And I know I'm not the only one that wishes they had the button in their car where they push it. And not that they would blow them up, but they would just magically be carried off over here in this big traffic jam with everybody else so I can be on my way. I know I'm not the only one. <clears throat> just as guilty just as guilty if I went, you know, our, our deeds, our actions, our, thought, our words, and our thoughts as well. So that, you know, we have to be very careful with that. Now, going to the top of page 87, you know, we fear and love God by looking after physically well-being of our neighbor. We do this by coming to the aid of our neighbor. There are times and places that we need to help. One of the great things that we do at this church is that we have our food bank, our community food bank. And for all the time that we have had the food bank, which is over 20 years now, um, the people of Manu have stepped up. They have helped. They have helped that, uh, the food bank here, very physical. Not only that, but other places as well, uh, and other organizations um, that our members do that, that, uh, that uh, God you know, has not only has blessed us so that we can bless others uh, as well. Uh, we speak it away. Let her be in the middle of the page that helps and defends our neighbor. We're going to talk about that in the Eighth Commandment even more. Treating our neighbor with kindness and compassion. 
that we look at upon our neighbor and if they need help, we help them or somehow we find someone who can help them um, in, in doing those things. Now, top of page 88. What do we need to remember about our neighbor when dealing with issues in society? Sometimes we have to remember this. We need to remember these things. God creates, preserves, and protects all life. He's caring, compassionate toward all he made, and he calls us to do that also. B, God gives special dignity and worth and protection to every human life from conception, that is fertilization. So when the egg and the sperm come together, God created humanity in his own image. God's son became man and shared our human nature. God has redeemed every human life by his holy, precious blood of Christ. Therefore, every human life is precious to God and to Christians. This, and, and uh, this will be covered a little later in the, in the, cat, in the part that we're going to talk about here, but I'm, I'm going to get to it now because we're running out of time. Uh, the whole issue about abortion, that seems to be a huge issue in our culture, in our society. That seems to be. It is. It is huge. Huge. Because there's a, there's a fundamental thought process here. You know, that baby in the womb, that is a baby in the womb. That's one of God's child, children. That is a person. And we have to say, wait a minute. We must protect that person like we would protect anybody else. And that's why we say that life begins at conception. There are others who think differently. You saw that bear itself out with uh, um, the Supreme Court Justice, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and the questions that were coming from uh, some of the senators, where they were standing. For them, they don't see it as a person, they see it as a blob, <sighs> inconvenience. We say, no, that's God's child. And we as God's people need to protect that child. The reason why I believe abortion is wrong because of two people. Well, more than two, but two pretty much. One is Jesus, for he was conceived in the womb, and John the Baptist. We read how the Holy Spirit came into John the Baptist while he was in his mother's womb. That that's a person who came to faith. I believe that my four children, before they were baptized, they heard of Jesus because their mom came to church. Their mom and I, we prayed every night. They heard my voice. They heard her voice. She would sing to them all the time. So that when I believe that they were baptized, they were, they, when, I, when I say the question, who wishes to be baptized? I'm sure they were going, oh, oh, I do. Because the Holy Spirit was already living in them. I believe that. That's why this, this issue about abortion is so wrong. I equate the, the, the abortion issue with about 150 to 100 or 200 years ago with the issue of slavery in our nation. There are many who thought that slavery was okay. They didn't have a problem with it. They are on the wrong side of history. I think those who believe that abortion is okay, they're going to be on the wrong side of history. That in the end, we're going to see that that's a person. That is a person, and we hold on to that. And that's why we must do our best to elect people who believe the same thing that I do. Just to let you know, the one, number one issue when I go in the voting booth is I ask myself, where do they stand on life issues that's what i ask all these other things it's not that they're not important but if you get the life thing wrong chances are you're going to get everything else wrong so that's the one thing that when i go into the voting booth i say where are they where are they on this and i will vote accordingly now just to let you know going back to the fourth commandment that all elected officials have what they're not perfect. They're not our Savior. There's only one Savior, and that's Jesus. Can God work through those people? Most definitely. And we see that throughout history, how God has done that. And we have to trust that God knows what he's doing when we elect our officials. Are there some, some officials that I want elected more than others? Most definitely. 
because they, they follow along the way that I think and believe. Now, will I survive if they're not elected? Yes. That just shows God will do miraculous things, that he'll make it happen as well. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that going on with that. So, um, <clears throat> so that's what's going on. We're going to stop here for now. And we'll pick this up next time. I have these sheets uh, for you so you can follow along. So read through that.